So our scripture this morning comes from the 12th chapter of Romans. And it and we're going to hear the one verses 1 through 8. I appeal to you therefore brothers and sisters, sorry, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is acceptable, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. And we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning, I invite you to pray with me before we get into this sermon. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So this morning, my imagination has been captured by the, those first two verses of our scripture. The ones that say, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then to not, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I think these few words contain a great deal that we are in need of in these current days. Well, in most days, right? The, 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 the first line there that, that, that really captures my imagination is this notion of a holy and living sacrifice. I think sometimes we think that sacrifice is, is a bad thing, right? You don't want to have to sacrifice a thing when you're making a decision, right? You don't want to have to, to make a, a different decision because, because of outside circumstances. You want to have it all, right? And here is Paul putting it in real terms of how it is to live. How it is to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That sometimes that, that to, to be that the desire, the need, the the important thing, Paul is saying here is to be all in. He's not saying be all in so everybody can beat up on you. That's not what he means. He's not saying be all in, be all in so that you can suffer. There may be some suffering. There may be some um, conditions we would would not you know choose, right? But what, what Paul is talking about here is, is, a, is, is a reminder that there is a difference, that there is a change to occur in your life. And to do that, to, to live into that change, is to be fully available to what God calls us into, a holy and living sacrifice. When we do the traditional liturgy for communion straight out of our book of worship for the United Methodist Church, it contains these lines as a reminder that we are to be living into what we are about to experience in communion. 
that, that to be holy and living sacrifices means that we are constantly checking in and checking out what God is about, that we might live more fully. So, so we take our full selves into this passage, right? And in the second verse, Paul tells us to be, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So as we take our whole selves into that action, what happens? What, what might be the result of living fully into that notion? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached on this passage numerous times. He preached on it when he was installed as pastor at his father's church. And he would preach it again and again as the movement for civil rights went on. And, and he preached it, he, he dis- and, he, and, 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 and over the years as he preached this passage, he, he distilled what, what he was talking, how, how he saw this passage and how he thought Paul saw this passage into two words that I think are really powerful for us in this season. And that is transformed nonconformity. Could there be more $10 words, right? Could, it, could, could we have language that, that is, is, is more lengthy? I'm not sure. But, but there's something there for me. This, this notion of transformed nonconformity. See, transformed nonconformity is not, isn't, is, isn't, isn't nonconformity for nonconformity's sake, right? Because I think we sometimes get caught in that trap, right? I want to dress different and look different so that people know I'm different, right? So that I'm, I'm known not to be a conformist, right? Maybe, maybe it, we also do it sometimes, people also do it sometimes to, to attract attention, right? But King posits that Paul is giving us a way forward in this passage by this idea of transformed nonconformity. A way that resists the immense, a way forward that that resists the immense pressure of cultural conformity. Now, maybe you don't think you walk to, to that beat, right? Maybe we're, we're Nevadans, right? We are independent thinkers. We are independent to a fault, right? We are independent just to be independent. And sometimes I think that independency leads us into conformity, right? We're conforming to this notion that we're not what we could be. uh, Transformed nonconformity is a way that resists the immense pressure of cultural conformity. That try to condition our minds and feet to move to the rhythmic drumbeat of the status quo. I love that line from from King. Because we, we do get comfortable, right? But as followers of Jesus, we have a higher loyalty, one that goes beyond fitting in and letting, letting how things are be the status quo, letting them remain. And transformed on conformity describes how we live both in the world and not of the world. You see, this kind of living takes a little bit more than placing a sticker on our car that says we are not of this world. King describes it as living in time, so in this world, in this, this time that we are existing in, and for eternity, meaning that we are connected to something far bigger than we can imagine, far bigger than we can make known, right? Far bigger than we, th- far bigger than us. King says we must make history and not be shaped by history. We are in this world but we are not completely of it. We are not completely, it is not completely, our, our identity is not completely defined by things of this world, by political affiliation, by, by family membership, by, by 
my team allegiance even. I know that's a scary thought, right? You see, I think that we have been caught in the Christian church. We have been caught for, for decades now in, 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 in having two extreme understandings of, of what it is that we are about, of, of how it is we are in this world, when in reality there is a mix of both and we have to hold the tension of both. So on the one hand, we, can f- we forget, and this is old-fashioned language, and, uh, that the world is fallen. That the world is not, perhaps a better way to say that is that the world is, is not all that God would have it be, right? And that there's brokenness in midst of redemption. And, and then on the, other, on the other hand, sometimes we, we take on, uh, it, so in the midst of this, this feeling that, 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 that there's nothing broken, that we just take on the culture whole cloth and, and, and assimilate, making us look not different, not having a stand that says the world could be better. And then on the other hand, we also for, tend to forget that the world is ultimately very good, right? That, 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 that both of those are held in tension, that God created something amazing, that we fail to see the goodness of God's creation, which, which causes us some to separate completely and, and condemn all culture as an irredeemably evil. Now, I, I've got a feeling that most of us don't live on either one of those extremes, right? What I know is, is that sometimes we push ourselves too far one way and too far the other, and so we, we get out, out of balance in what it is that we feel God calling us into. Or, or our, our way, our ability to see, our ability to see where God is gets all confused. But there is a middle way where we love and engage the world without separating ourselves. Um, or without allowing ourselves to be uncritically integrated into it. Paul is calling us to use our brains. Anybody up for that? I am. I really want to see what happens when we critically think about all the things that are coming at us. When we critically think about about news, whether it's real or fake or somewhere in between. When we really think about the the things that we give our lives to. Are we giving our lives to things that are that are that are that are transient? Or are we are we working in the ways to bring the kingdom of God? See, when I look at Jesus' life and, 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 and I look at how it is that we follow, we are called to follow Jesus. I see a life lived by Jesus of transformed nonconformity. He didn't just do things because it was the opposite of authority, right? He didn't just talk with women who he was not supposed to have that kind of contact with. He didn't just not do that for no reason, right? But, he, but, but Jesus lived a life of transformed nonconformity. He said, these are people too. That woman at the well, the woman we talked about just last week who begged for just crumbs. Some of Jesus' most powerful lessons come with his interactions with, with these women, Right? When, when, but he's intentional about his nonconformity, right? He sees what is possible in people who have been tossed aside. He, he sees hope and wholeness in those who have been forgotten. I think of the man sitting, sitting by the edge of the water waiting for it to, be tremble, to tremble and then waiting to have someone who can help him experience it. 
following Jesus is finding a way to love and engage the world. To love and engage the world for the kingdom of God. Not to, to build an army, not to, but, but for the, the, the freedom and the hope and the deliverance, not just of ourselves, but of, of our neighbors and of creation. Now, this term, transform nonconformity, has a corollary term that, that maybe you've heard of and maybe you haven't, but I think it's really important. And, and, it, and it goes with this notion of how we hold the tension between what is and what God is calling into being. And it's positively maladjusted. That's about being maladjusted to the things that the culture says we should just get used to. The things that, that are holding not just us, but others bound. So think about it. King says it this way. There are some things in our world to which men of goodwill must be maladjusted. I confess that I never intend to become adjusted to the evils of segregation and the crippling effects of discrimination to the moral degeneracy of religious bigotry and the corroding effects of narrow sectarianism, to, an economic, to economic conditions that deprive men of work and food, and to the insanities of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence. King points out and uh, Looking at Jesus reminds uh, Jesus' life and teachings reminds us that as disciples of Jesus Christ, our, tra our transformed nonconformity has a direction towards the kingdom of God. That's what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, don't, don't let the world say you have no value. Don't, don't let others besides God determine what your gifts are. And, 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 and move in this direction. Now I know the, the, the hard question is, how do we do that? How do we, how do we get from where we are, which is all confused and confuted, right? Well, there's a couple ways I want to remind you of. First of all, Paul lists a bunch of spiritual gifts. It's not, a most, it's not the most complete get list of spiritual gifts in our scripture this morning. There are other places that have longer lists. So if you don't feel like you're one of those things that I listed off earlier, don't worry. That's not the only valuable ones. Every gift that God has given is valuable in the kingdom of God. So we should be using our spiritual gifts, those things that come easy to us, that people seem to respond from. I know I've mentioned this before, but, but the example I give of a spiritual gift used in God, the, the kingdom of God is I have a friend who is the person you talk to, right? The bartender will talk to us at a bar. The waitress will sit, pull up a chair and sit down. It's happened, right? And, and, and things will pour out of people's mouths, and you go, how in the heck did you get that? And she, she will go, it's just who I am. People do that, right? So maybe you're the teacher, maybe you're the one, maybe you're not a professional teacher, like that's not, that was not your vocational call, but, but you're the one who people come to with a question and, and you can struggle and learn from one another. There are ways in which our spiritual gifts, the, the, the cheerful giving and, and meeting people where they are, are so important. You see, that's why they're interconnected here in this scripture, why, why Paul puts them together is that those are the building blocks that the body of Christ needs in order to build the kingdom of God. Not a single one of us can build the kingdom of God by ourselves. We might get glimpses sometimes, but we are not able to sustain and hold on to and to shape the world in God's image, in the image of the kingdom of God without one another. So you use your spiritual gifts and you remain in community and we see where we discern. I love this word, discern. That the idea that, that we don't have to take everything at once, but we can use our minds and our experience and the experience of others and the traditions to figure it out, to 
to, to, to wrap ourselves and to, to hope and to deliver the kingdom of God. I want to leave you with the message version of these first two verses because I think they may help you. But they will definitely, definitely give clarity to this conversation, I hope. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly to respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Amen? Amen.